slide launcher. Good morning, everyone, and then I declare the meeting open to the public. Um, online and I'd like to welcome all our members who are participating today by video conferencing. Can I remind members about the protocols regarding the use of electronic devices? Um, there have been no apologies received for this morning's meeting um, and, and there are no, it's a full attendance. Uh, I would like today, just in terms of chairperson's business, to I'd like to welcome Carol to our committee this morning and also to acknowledge and thank Pat Sheehan for his contribution uh, through what has been a hugely difficult and a uh, uh, pressurized time within the committee and i think uh, i want to thank pat and to welcome carol onto our committee i'm sure she would equally make a fantastic contribution i would also just like to acknowledge that we are we are joined this morning for the first time by our new clerk keith mcbride and to welcome keith to the role as well and also to thank elish hi for her considerable contribution and all of the staff indeed over over that period of time since the committee was formed uh, I would also like to acknowledge this week that uh, it's Children's Mental Health Week and I think it's probably one of the most difficult times any of us have ever seen for our own children and, and children generally. Um, schools closed, connections with friends disrupted, worry about the pandemic, parents um, parents at home a lot of the time or parents working on the on the front line and worries about that and I just want to say to all children out there and I'm very conscious that the committee have been actually contacted directly by a number of children from Neve Louise and we have a very very clear I think understanding of the difficulties and I want to let every child out there today know that it really is okay not to be okay and please please talk to someone if you're feeling if you're feeling under pressure you're feeling that your things are too difficult please speak to someone speak to some of your family speak to some of the friends or family or teachers or whoever whoever you're in touch with so um i would move on then members to the draft minutes and i refer you to the draft minutes of the meeting of the 28th of january which is a tab 3.1 are members content with those minutes yeah content thank you Matters arising then, members. There is one item under matters arising today. I refer members to the clerk's memo at tab 4.1 of the pack. Members will remember that at last week's meeting, the committee discussed uh, the matter of a social media post by a member of the Board of Education in relation to conversion therapy and the impact of LGBT. A copy of the now deleted post and a link to the article are provided there in the clerk's memo. A number of proposals were put forward last week and the committee agreed to defer its decision until today's meeting to allow members time to consider this matter. A member has now provided a proposal to the committee for consideration. The text of the proposal is provided in the clerk's memo. Um, so the, the, the text of the proposal is that this health committee notes recent public support for the discredited, harmful and homophobic practice known as conversion therapy, which is a, a severe breach of an individual's most basic human rights, most significantly the right to be free from torture, inhuman and degrading treatment. Further notes, it was recently publicly promoted by a leading member of the Education Authority with responsibility for the education, mental health and emotional well-being of young people. The Health Committee condemns conversion therapy as it is long-term deeply damaging to the mental health and emotional well-being of the LGBT plus community. So um, I just... I'd like to ask members, have they any have they any comments? And I'll go first of all to Orlea as the proposer of that uh, motion, of that yeah. position. Yeah, thank you, Chair. And um, I know obviously there was a bit of discussion around this at the, the committee meeting last week, and I completely understand and appreciate that not all members um, had a chance to um, look at the post and, and see the detail and that they weren't across the detail. So, um, I hope that um, over the past week that members have been able to uh, take note of the motion and the detail around it and maybe to consider, um, I hope they can consider um, supporting it. I just feel it. I know I made these comments um, last Thursday, but as the Committee for Health, um, you know, we obviously have a responsibility. We have identified mental health and wellbeing as one of our most important priorities in this committee. Um, and I think that it's it's harmful it's hurtful and it's homophobic when we see any comments uh, made publicly or shared publicly around the um, the concept of conversion therapy. And I have no doubt that 
that would um, obviously have um, a detrimental impact to the mental health of our LGB and T community. So I would hope the committee can come together um, today to condemn the concept of conversion therapy and support the motion, hopefully. Thank you. Um, Pam Cameron, go ahead. Uh, bring in Deputy Chair Pam Cameron there. Thank you, Chair, and, and thanks, uh, Olea, for that clarity around that. Um, I just want to make it very clear from the outset that I am absolutely in no way supportive of any so-called um, conversion therapy. And as a party, we uh, want to certainly note the views of professional bodies on issues relating to conversion therapy and, of course, want to take uh, those um, relevant expert advice into, into um, full view. However, let's be clear, this gentleman who was subject um, of this post did not undergo conversion therapy. He attended a church service. Um, so someone attending a, a, a religious service, especially when um, it is said, when that um, they said that the service did not focus on issues of sexuality, um, I, I certainly think that this in no way um, amounts to conversion therapy of any description. Um, the, the motion, I, I feel, is therefore is based on a false definition of what conversion therapy actually is. So I, I would actually, I can't obviously support, um, I mean, as a party will not be supporting this motion, um, but um, I would urge the committee to write to um, both Mr Beck and Mr McCausland and ask them for their views on conversion therapy before agreeing really to be banishing them with, with um, these type of claims. Um, I certainly, um, I have information um, in front of me that actually demonstrates that Mr. Beck, in particular, has has been quoted as saying that that he doesn't know what this row is about, that he has never had conversion therapy, nor would he because he doesn't believe in it. So I think that's fairly clear. And also, Mr. McCausen has stressed that Mr. Beck had not gone any conversion therapy, and that the criticism on that basis was based on a false premise. So I think it would be important to. Um, to not be referring to these gentlemen in, in this uh, particular motion and um, if needs be that we should seek their view on the issue before uh, moving further with it. So as it stands, I, we cannot support the motion in front of us. Thank you, uh, Pam. I'm going there to Carol. Carol Nicolin, go ahead, Carol. Thank you. Um, well, I support the motion. I second it. Um, I believe that because neither were mentioned, neither men were mentioned in the motion, I think it's fairly uh, credible to ask for that clarification and to put the committee's position on this issue on the record. Uh, given the fact that we're in, you know, look at talking about mental health and the impact on children and young people, and yet in all, you know, the controversy, and there was controversy around that article and indeed controversy in terms of some of the commentary that I would certainly propose or second or lay's uh, motion. I think it will be really good, given all I've said, that we were very, very clear on this issue in terms of our opposition to so-called conversion therapy. Thank you, uh, Jerry. Carl, go ahead, Jerry. Yeah, thanks, Chair. And yeah, I want to thank Olea for, for bringing this again, and I want to uh, support the motion as well. We spent a lot of time in this committee talking about, you know, dangerous theories uh, in the in the context of COVID and how that could affect uh, people's lives. I mean, this is a dangerous theory that affects, you know, LGBT uh, plus people uh, is offensive. Um, and to be frank, I'm not really interested in Mr. McCausland's um, written response. I could kind of maybe predict what he would say. Um, and I think there's, he has a bit of form with uh, questionable views, uh, to put it nicely. So uh, I think this, this motion is, is pretty clear. Um, we should say conversion therapy uh, is totally wrong, has no basis uh, except but to promote uh, hatred. So I'm, I'm happy to support the motion as well. Thank you. And Paula Bradshaw? Um, thank, you, next, thank you, Chair. Just to, to say that I fully support the motion. Thank you, Orlea, for bringing it forward. I think the wording of it is, is very good. I suppose the only positive thing that has come out of this very unfortunate situation is that we now have a public discussion around it, and I hope that this helps perpetuate the um, banning, bringing into a law to ban conversion therapy through the Department for Community Centre rather than later. Thank you. Thank you. And Alan? 
Yes, uh, Chairman, I, I would want to put on record as well my total opposition to this concept of conversion therapy. I think it has been widely discredited. Uh, however, I, 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 my little difficulty that I have is that uh, you know we as a committee are setting the trails up here as, as police, uh, judge and jury, uh, in, in, in the wording of, of this motion. Um, I think that the, uh, it should really be sufficient for us as a committee uh, to uh, reaffirm uh, and to place on public record uh, our total, uh, and I would hope unanimous, uh, opposition uh, to this particular type of uh, uh, alleged treatment. Uh, but I think that in relation to the individuals involved, uh, I don't think that we should be dealing with that. I think that we should refer that uh, to the appropriate authorities, and that may be the, the education authority uh, on which uh, Mr. McCausland sits. So uh, is it possible, Chair, for me to place an amendment on the, the floor to the motion, or what, what's the protocol around that? Um, well, yeah, I'm happy for you to put the amendment, Alan, and I'll put that to members. Um, but uh, you're you're quite within your rights to put the amendment. Yes, I'd like, I'd like to place an amendment that the committee uh, reaffirms its total opposition uh, to uh, the concept of uh, uh, this conversion uh, therapy, uh, and uh, secondly, that we then refer the matter uh, or the involvement. Uh, of Mr. McCausland uh, to the appropriate education authority for them to uh, investigate and uh, comment on. Okay. Um, any other views from any members? Sure, can I, I have to. Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, so listen, I I have I have no issue with um, Alan's um, proposed amendment in the sense, I think the first part of the amendment, it's already covered in the motion that the health committee condemns conver conversion therapy. So, so that's there. Um, I think the second part about asking the education authority to look further into it, um, into the specifics of it, you know, in the motion, we haven't mentioned any individuals, but I certainly have no issue with adding in an additional line where we ask the education authority to look further into it, or we ask the education committee, or whatever form of words, without mentioning anybody's name specifically. Um, I have no problem with that, but I still think that it doesn't change um, the substance of the content of the motion as as it stands. Well, could you reaffirm the wording of it, please? Just what's that, Alan? Sorry, I didn't fully catch that. <laughs> Just so for Leah could just reaffirm the wording, the exact wording of the motion, please. Just yeah, go, go ahead, Arlia. Yes, Alan. So it is that this health committee notes recent public support for the discredited, harmful, and homophobic practice known as conversion therapy, which is a severe breach of an individual's most basic human rights, most significantly the right to be free from torture, inhumane, and degrading treatment. Um, it further notes that it was a, it further notes that it was recently publicly promoted by a leading member of the education authority with responsibility for the education, mental health, and emotional well-being of young people. Um, that this health committee condemns conversion therapy at it, as it is long-term deeply damaging to the mental health and emo emotional well-being. Of the LGB and T community. Chair? Yeah, go ahead, Jonathan. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, I suppose probably my signal has been dropping in and out, but, um, you know, I, I still believe that, and the Chair has outlined quite clearly our position on this. Um, I, th I think, albeit the, the someone talking about the premise that this does not mention the individuals, it's quite clear. That it mentioned that it's in reference to the particular individual, Mr. McCausen in, in particular, and I think it's wrong. I think Alan is absolutely right in what he says that this committee is trying to be the judge, jury, and executioner in relation to censoring uh, people's social media posts. It's not a it's not a line that I am comfortable with. Uh, I, even at that, the Education Authority is not a body which is under the remit of this committee. Would it be much more appropriate for the Education Committee? To, to look at this, so you no, know, I'm I'm not comfortable uh, to with this uh, proposal, and uh, that's already been put on the record. 
Okay, and um, just just in relation to the uh, the article itself and the sharing of it, I have to say I read the article again in, in, in more detail, and I have to say I was totally shocked by the content of that article. And I mean, some of the things it says was, I recently met up with uh, the individual who, who wrote the, uh, uh, the, uh, the subject of the thing, the place where his encounter with coffee drinking, Bible study, and Christians set his conversion in motion. So it clearly refers to conversion, um, but some of the some of the statements within the article, um, in terms of people uh, finding their way back and and you know all all of that, I found entirely shocking. I have to say, um, I don't think we're censoring anyone. To be quite honest, I think we are making a comment on what someone has said using using their right of right of freedom of speech. I think uh, I think we are we are responding to that. So, um, Alan, I, I actually think what you had referred to there as an amendment is actually a different proposal where, where, you're, uh, where you're suggesting a, a somewhat different course of action, so, which, is, which is to reaffirm a total opposition to conversion therapy and also to write. And that then Orlea's proposal is her wording and to add the line, and to add the line that, that we were right to. Can you just give me the additional line, Orlea, please, that you're, you would add? In, 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 in to reflect the conversation that you feel? Yeah. Well, I know last week we had mentioned at one stage about um, possibly writing to the Education Committee to see if they want to take it up then, if they wanted to take it further with the, the Education Authority, because then that would fall under their remit. But I mean, with Jonathan's comments about, you know, our responsibility as a health committee, we absolutely do have responsibility to protect the well-being and the mental health of vulnerable high-risk groups in our community who we already know are at a disadvantage and more likely to take their own lives because of homophobic comments, because of discrimination, because of numerous reasons. And that is why I feel so passionately about this because I mean, the work that we, we have done um, around the issue of suicide prevention, I've heard the, the statistics quoted so many times about our LGBT communities and how they are a high risk group. And this is the last thing and this is why I think it's important for us to make a stand against this concept of conversion therapy. It's wrong, and we need to call it out. Yeah. For me, uh, the, uh, if I could come in, uh, I, I mean, I have to say, I, I, I appreciate Orlea's passion. Uh, she doesn't have a monopoly in that passion. I think we all share that passion, uh, that, uh, that this is wrong. Uh, and I think that it's sufficient for this uh, uh, health committee to uh, reaffirm that, that we are totally and utterly opposed to it. But it's this concept that we're taking on a role, whether we name the person by name or by implication, it's quite yeah. clear who we're talking about. If we go down that road, I think that this committee will set an, an extremely dangerous precedent that in future we are going to have to be police and judge and jury yeah. of a lot of things that people say that maybe really have uh, we don't have a remit to do. I certainly think we have a remit to protect uh, the well-being of people, uh, and I, I think that we can do that by uh, the amendment that I put on the floor, and it is an amendment. Uh, and I think that the um, we should leave then the retribution or punishment for those remarks, alleged remarks, uh, should lie with an appropriate authority. And I don't think that the health committee is the appropriate authority. Uh, to, uh, to 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 make those decisions. Chair, can okay. I come in? So, Jerry, 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 I'm going to Jerry Carroll first, and then I'll come back to you quickly, Jonathan, and then we will we will need to move it on to a conclusion. Go ahead, Jerry. Thanks, Charles. I'll be brief. But um, this is the, the responsibility of, of the health committee because this is a bogus uh, therapy in, in quotation marks being described as such. So it's being described as healthcare when it's not, so we should be discussing this. But also, let's be frank, this isn't somebody, you know, in your street or a neighbour. This is somebody that used to be uh, an executive minister, that used to be uh, an MLA, that I presume is probably still a, a member uh, of, uh, you know, Jonathan's uh, and Pam's party. So it's not like it's somebody that does not have influence, that isn't getting still media attention and is presented as a commentator. So I think it's very, very important that we stand as a committee strong on this and say we uh, we, we back the motion and we uh, oppose this, this form of therapy. Okay, uh, so I'm going to go to to uh, Jonathan and then yeah. Pam and then I would like to I would like to to wrap this up, members. Go ahead, thanks, Jonathan. Thanks, Chair. No, I I I still think members are dangering into um, a, a very 
dangerous president in, in the committee. You know, your own quote, quote chair in relation to conversion began. I, I think your quote could very easily be taken out of context. Is it the context of which it was uh, said within within the article? I think that's a very dangerous line to go down. And as for Orlaith's uh, comment in relation to we have a duty to protect the mental health of all of those as a health committee, absolutely. I stand fully behind that. But if we want to go down the road where we want to censor individuals' uh, social media tweets or whatever that aren't even a member of this committee, well, does that not stand for your own tweets, Orlias? Whenever over Christmas, when you, when you talked about uh, your the fallen volunteers of the provisional IRA, therefore, what about the victims uh, of terrorism and their mental health and the the serious risk that there is to adverse mental health right across our community? So we we cannot go down a road where we are um, being selective in who we choose to criticise in this committee. Let's get that very clear. If we're going to uh, pr- protect those that have uh, rightly um, serious mental health problems due to the commentary around individuals, let's, let's, let's keep it in, in, in line and let's, let's go with what uh, members on this committee have said. I have no problem whatsoever in writing to the two individuals that you're clearly mentioning, albeit referring that you're not mentioning to them, Let's write to them as individuals. Let's get their opinion and this have it out there. But let's not have this committee go down the road of judge, jury and executioner. Can I come back in? I'm not sure. Uh, I'll go to Pam first and then I'll come back to you earlier. Go ahead, Pam. Thanks, Chair. No, it was just to say that uh, I think it's very clear that the individuals that we're talking about. So I I just I couldn't support any motion that's actually referring um, to either of these individuals. I think that's really, really brutally unfair on them. I think we should be asking both those individuals for clarity. And I would suggest that we do that and not proceed with with the motion as it as it is standing um, for now. And I again, I want to reiterate that it, it's absolutely not about, I am completely opposed to conversion therapy and, uh, and any um, idea around it, completely opposed to it. I want to make that very, very clear. I don't have any objection to this committee opposing conversion therapy, but I don't want to see uh, references men who who, who are can't, can't they're not here to defend themselves against the the comments from this committee, and I don't think it's this committee's place to to sit in judgment over them. Thank you. Okay, Arlea. Yeah, look, sure. So I, um, you know, I have made my my position obviously clear on this, and the wording of the motion has been circulated for all members to see and review before today's discussion. But what I would like to take issue with is I think it's completely unacceptable that Jonathan is using a, a tweet that I posted around the Christmas period, um, that he is using that in as part of this conversation around conversion therapy and calling that out. I don't get it. I don't get the parallels that you're drawing. And I think it's inappropriate, Jonathan. No, you want to go down the road of condemning tweets. You know, we can be as broad as you want, Arliath. Okay, members. I support the mental health of all citizens in this country. As do I. Okay. Okay, members. I'm going to I'm going to uh, move on to the proposal. I'm going to uh, members have have made their views very clear and can do so in terms of in terms of that. But I am going to put uh, Orlea's proposal then um, with the with the uh, clerk. Can you read the complete proposal with the additional line? Do you have that in front of you? Um, certainly. So the additional line is to refer it on to the, the committee for education. Orlea, is that correct? No. Yeah, yes, Keith, that's that's that okay. I suggest yes, thank you. Um so the the motion is that this health committee notes recent public support for the discredited, harmful and homophobic practice known as conversion therapy, which is a severe breach of an individual's most basic human rights, most significantly the right to be free from torture, inhumane and degrading treatment. Further notes that it recently publicly promoted by a leading member of the Education Authority with responsibility for the education mental health and emotional well-being of young people. Um, This health committee condemns conversion therapy as it is a long-term, deeply damaging to the mental health and emotional well-being of the LGBT plus community. Um, And then there will be a line, the committee will write to the education committee to highlight, um, sorry, to request that the education committee take this issue forward with the education authority. 
Yep. All those in favor of that motion? Sorry, so I have Colin or yeah, Paula. I can't see Jerry at the minute. Okay, Jerry. My camera is acting up, but I'm in favor of the motion. Okay, and I can't see Carol at the minute. Is Carol there? Yeah, um, Kate, I'm supporting the motion. Yeah, no I'm here. Yeah, sorry, I couldn't see you, Carol. Um, okay. Okay, so that's all those in favor, Chair. All those against? <clears throat> so I have Pam, Jonathan, and Alan, I can't see you there. Are you? I uh, wish to abstain. I agree with certain rules of the motion, but not the entire motion. I'm abstaining. Okay, no problem. Um, so, Chair, the motion passes. Okay. Okay, the, mo the motion passes then. Alan, do you wish to put a further proposal? Uh, well, my proposal just was a, uh, I think it's superseded now, but my proposal was that this committee uh, does register its, its total opposition to the concept of conversion therapy uh, and uh, uh, rights to uh, the uh, education authority. Uh, so, to so basically, that was it. So uh, I mean, I just the, the part of Orlea's motion that I don't agree with was the the, the, the implied naming of an individual. Uh, as Palmer said, you know, when you're pointing the finger at people, I think it's uh, we're talking about human rights. Surely, the most basic human right is the right to respond to allegations or accusations or, uh, that have been made against you. That's the most basic human right, uh, and I think that that, uh, in, in, in the wording of this motion, we've actually violated that. Okay, Alan, and you have, you, have made that, you have made that clear, so thank you. Okay, members, we're moving on then to item five, which is the Food Standards Agency and a common framework on food and feed safety and hygiene, and I just want to check that, uh, that we have the relevant officials online. To brief us on this, uh, Clerk, yes, we do have okay. everyone online, do we? Yes, everyone's yeah. there, Chair. Okay, thank you. So item five is a briefing on the food and feed safety and hygiene common framework, specifically the provisional framework outline agreement and concordat, which have been developed by the Food Standards Agency in conjunction with their counterparts in Scotland, Wales and England. I refer you there, members, to tab five of your pack, and I can advise members that officials from the Food Standards Agency are here today to brief the committee on the proposed framework and to take questions. A copy of their opening statement is at page 27. So I'd now like to welcome by video link, Ms. Emily Miles, who is Chief Executive of the Food Standards Agency, Ms. Maria Jennings, who is the NA Director of the Food Standards Agency here in the North, and um, I'd like to invite, uh, well, I'd like first of all just to indicate that if one, if one of you could indicate which of you are answering the substantive questions, should members have questions, and also, and I see uh, at least one of you there have a set of headsets, which is useful, and could you also check that your email is muted, because we sometimes get a lot of pinging from emails from, from the very busy people who are generally uh, presenting to us, uh, there's normally a, a, an email trail, so... Welcome this morning. Is it is it Emily? Is it yourself that's leading off on this issue this morning for us? Yes, please. Thank you, Chair. Can you hear me okay? I can hear you. Thank you. And very welcome to Fulcher Road, Goji and, and Rinse Launcher. You're very welcome to the Health Committee. Thank you very much. And, and thank you, Chair. And thank you, Members. I'll just give the opening statement and then we'd be very pleased to take questions. Um, and in fact, I was in front of you a couple of months ago on um, the nutrition labelling uh, framework as well. So um, it's, I, I have a sense of where you might go, but we'll see where we go. So um, I am very grateful for this opportunity to give evidence to the committee. Um, today our focus is on the food and feed safety and hygiene common framework and the development of this framework has been led by my colleagues in the Food Standards Agency alongside officials from Food Standards Scotland. The development of common frameworks is extremely important to the Food Standards Agency and shows our commitment to strengthening the close links and collaborative working arrangements already in place across Northern Ireland, England, Wales and Scotland. And just to emphasise that, Chair, we are a body that works in Northern Ireland, England and Wales, and that is incredibly important to us as a founding principle. 
The framework puts into place an agreement committing the four nations to continue working together in the area of food and feed safety and hygiene at all levels and provides mechanisms for discussing and agreeing divergence where this is appropriate for maintaining high levels of consumer protection. The United Kingdom and devolved administration constitutional teams have been engaged throughout the development of the framework and importantly they have given their approval to the framework's proposals. The framework consists of three interlinked documents. So firstly, the framework outline, which sets the detailed principles and processes that the four countries will follow when developing food and feed safety and hygiene policy. Secondly, the concordat, which sets out ministerial commitments under the framework. Thirdly, a revised version of the memorandum of understanding between the two food safety bodies, the FSA and Food Standards Scotland which sets out the operational detail of official level engagement and collaboration. We have carried out careful consultation on the framework proposals to deliver as effective a framework as possible. This has included engagement with key industry bodies, both written and then virtual, with an event on the 9th of October 2020. In Northern Ireland, the industry associations and retailers were provided with a summary of the framework. Initial feedback and questions were encouraged on the framework proposals. In Northern Ireland, we received one written response to the written feedback requests and three attendees registered via Northern Ireland for the online session. In general, stakeholders have been very supportive of the framework proposals and considered them an effective means of achieving a unified regulatory regime after the end of the transition period. We have strong relationships with the Northern Irish food industry and their associations, and we continue to engage with Northern Ireland industry on consequences of EU exit, including the importance of structures and governance of four nation collaboration and decision making post transition. Uh, we have ensured our regular, regular industry engagement has included a focus on the framework, such as through the Northern Ireland food industry liaison group. Further consideration of the framework has been provided by ministers both individually and collectively through the Joint Ministerial Committee Provisional Agreement um, and also by senior officials through the Joint UK Government and Devolved Administration Frameworks Project Board, as well as Food Standards Agency and Food Standards Scotland Board discussions on the proposal, proposals. And you'll know that our board discussions happen in public. The framework proposals um, do not change, uh, and neither does leaving the EU change the FSA's top priority, which is to ensure that food remains safe and is what it says it is. We, um, and the board has committed very clearly to this, our high standard of food safety and consumer protection will be maintained. The framework facilitates this across the UK by building upon and formalising the collaborative ways of working that we already have in place. The areas in scope of the framework are areas of retained EU law, and these are detailed in the framework, as you'll know. But the legislation covers all stages of food and feed production, including general food and feed hygiene rules, food and feed safety standards, such as products that require specific approval, like additives and novel food, food and feed law enforcement, that includes things like official controls, labelling related to food safety such as allergens and public health controls on imported food and feed. The, the legislation within the scope of the framework falls within Annex 2 of the Northern Ireland Protocol and therefore EU legislation for food and feed safety and hygiene will continue to be directly applicable in Northern Ireland. While the circumstances in Northern Ireland will be different as a result of the Northern Ireland Protocol, Northern Ireland's full participation in risk assessment and risk management processes will ensure that any decisions taken in the UK for implementation consider the potential impacts of legislative changes across all four nations, consumers and businesses, including Northern Ireland. Meaningful collaboration across the four nations underpins the governance and structures within this framework, particularly with sharing of common resources of expertise in risk analysis including surveillance, research, emerging issues, and intelligence. Now that the transition period has ended, one of the key responsibilities is managing risks in the food chain.
Going forward, we, the FSA and Food Standards Scotland, will continue to assess food and feed safety risks and provide independent advice to consumers, to health ministers and others, so that people can trust that the food that they buy is safe and is what it says it is. This risk analysis work has always been undertaken by the Food Standards Agency and Food Standards Scotland together. Um, regular and routine communication already occurs between policy teams and scientists across the four nations. These arrangements have been strengthened to allow joint development of risk management advice to ministers, and I can say more about that in questioning if, you're, if you would like to know more. We recognise that the framework will be constantly evolving and will be subject to ongoing monitoring and review, and a review process is embedded within the framework. So thank you for your time this morning, and we would be happy to take any questions. Okay, thank you, thank you very much, Emily. That is very useful. So you had you had actually touched upon there towards the end on on the issue of um, the risk analysis and how the how the provisional framework takes into account the protocol here. Um, so I'm wondering how that interacts and how that uh, how that risk assessment is done and how it ensures that the uh, the very important regulatory alignment for our our food process and food production uh, industry here um, is protected moving forward. So I'd appreciate some more information on that. Thank you. Thank you. So you, you'll know that in Northern Ireland, Northern Ireland will continue to keep pace with EU um, rules and changes on food and feed safety. Um, and then in Great Britain, uh, we will be considering our own rules. Um, the, the, what we're going to do is keep a very close eye on what um, the EU developments are. So we have set up a horizon scanning function in the Food Standards Agency. Uh, we've trained our policy colleagues to make sure they can carry out desk-based monitoring of EU legislation which will include things like checking the comatology register, which is the register of EU committees and, and documents and the committee's meetings. Um, and then we're in regular contact too with the UK mission in Europe, UCMIS Europe, who will provide additional intelligence on proposals. In addition, the Northern Ireland Civil Service um, and the Northern Ireland Executive have their own office in Brussels, which will be keeping an eye on what the EU does. Um, so we will be following uh, what happens, uh, and I should have had actually, we have very close working relationships with the Food Standards Authority in Ireland. So that's another way that we can keep track of what's going on. So, um, and then there are formal notification provision, provisions in the Trade and Cooperation Agreement where um, the EU and the UK have to notify each other of changes to the law. So this is the means by which we will keep track. Um, as far as possible, we expect, uh, because this is driven by science um, and it's about food safety and what the consumer interests are in, in food, we expect um, there is unlikely to be much divergence in arrangements. So, for example, um, there will be uh, people, uh, businesses applying for the authorization of new feed additives um, and the scientific assessment of that will be done by us. It will also be done by EFSA, the European Food Safety Authority, and it's highly unlikely that we would come to different views um, because the science is the science. So uh, we expect, as, uh, in, in the main, things will keep track with each other. There may be some differences in timescales. The rules are very, very strict about um, the processes uh, that you have to, um, the timescales where you have to consider these applications. So if an application arrived sooner at the EU than it arrived in GB, then it might move slightly differently, but it, the, the end result would uh, we would expect to be the same. Um, I'll pause there. There's lots more to say about it, but um, that you may have follow up questions, Chair. Um, no, that that that's okay for me for now on that on that issue. The other thing that I was and and members may want to to explore that, but the other thing that I wanted to explore with you, Emily, was you've mentioned that there was stakeholder engagement in September and October in relation to the framework. What was the outcome of that and how did you engage with stakeholders here in, in the north? And, so and what sort of extent what sort of extent was that? Thank you. Ask, thank you. I'll ask Maria, our Northern Ireland director, to say a little bit more detail about that. But just in principle, um, so yes, we did engage. We, we've, um, 
uh, we did this big stakeholder engagement event online. We had lots of people coming and then we've also written to people and had written feedback. I would say that in Northern Ireland, we've been finding that our stakeholder engagement with businesses and consumer groups and local authorities has been heavily focused on the implementation of the end of the transition period. So we haven't had as much uh, response on the frameworks question yet. And I think that's probably right in terms of a prioritization approach. The, the frameworks set out a means by which um, uh, uh, we follow each other's um, processes and laws and where uh, there's a dispute resolution process for ministers to come in and uh, raise a flag if they're concerned. So this will be something that operates over a long period and it will have an annual review process so we can keep adjusting it. So I can understand why stakeholders would be particularly focused on the immediate questions at the end of the transition period. But Maria, perhaps you could, you could supplement what I've said. Thank you very much, Emily, and good morning, everyone. Um, yes, just to um, explain a little bit of the background of how we engage uh, with our food industry. And uh, we have, can everybody hear me okay? Yeah, we're hearing you fine. I'm, uh, we're hearing you fine, Maria, thank you. Lovely, Colin, thank you. Um, we established a, a food industry liaison group way back in 2008, and it was on the back of one of our big incidents. Um, and that group is a, a representative group of all of right across the food industry, food and feed industry, actually. Um, and that group has proved very valuable to us, um, you know, over, over the years. And we talk to them on a very regular basis. Now, um, but, um, in the last few months, we have been working jointly with DERA to talk to that group, particularly around their COVID-19 pressures and also um, the, the EU exit transition issues that, that they would raise with us more generally. But on the 21st of January, um, we took that group in some detail through our uh, framework uh, proposals. And they were generally content with what we were, uh, we were um, telling them. Um, their biggest concern is that they would still have access into the GB market because that's their biggest market. And uh, we, we obviously were able to reassure them that that would be the case. Um, all food that is produced in alignment with the European Union will be uh, will have unfettered market access to uh, GB. So the industry is um, quite uh, quite content with that, and we will continue to be talking to them. It's a regular meeting that we have with them, so we will continue to have these conversations through that route. Can you provide the committee with the with the membership of that group to give us some idea of the the extent and the and the areas covered? Colin, we sent that through in our response to the nutrition framework um, conversation. So it's in a letter to the committee that you've received already. Okay, thank you. And I will move on then to members. So first of all, go to Jonathan, then I'll come to Carol and then Paula. So Jonathan, go ahead, please. Uh, Jonathan, we're not hearing you at the moment there. You Sorry, don't appear to be on mute. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yeah, hear you. Uh, I'm thanks, hearing you now, I yeah. Thank you, Emily, and thank you, Maria, for your presentation. I suppose in, in reading this uh, common framework, it, it still, to me, highlights the absolute follies contained within the Northern Ireland Protocol. Uh, I have a lot of concern in relation to that and believe that direct action will need to be taken. The framework suggests that in some instances, Northern Ireland will be unable to implement the same food and feed safety policy approaches as the GB countries will. It would be useful to know what those areas are right now and which areas are likely to come under threat of divergence in the very near future. It is also a very clear risk for the new products entering Northern Ireland will be carried by the EU with no allowance of assessing implement, implement, or implications on a UK-wide basis in terms of protecting human health. But can I ask uh, the, the representatives here today, what mechanism, mechanisms, if any, are included under this framework to allow devolved regions to input into trade negotiations in the areas covered, i.e. food standards, to minimise divergence? And is there a fear that the provisions of the Internal Market Bill will allow uh, mutual recognition, etc., may allow uh, regions to override the aims of the framework in the future? Thank you.
Thank yeah, you. Yeah, thank you. Um, across across to our panel, please. Thank you, Emily. Thank you, Jonathan. That was a lot in, in that question, so thank you. Um, uh, let's start at, at the end, which was the question about trade. So um, uh, you'll know that trade is a reserve matter. DEFRA and the Department for International Trade um, work closely with the devolved administrations to deliver a trade policy um, that is intended to work for the whole of the United Kingdom. Um, so uh, obviously, whilst trade is reserved, devolved administrations are responsible for implementing and observing obligations arising from those trade agreements. Um, there is a ministerial forum for international trade, which ensures a regular and formal structure to support discussion and engagement on potential trade agreements. Um, and uh, I should say more specifically from the Food Standards Agency point of view, we are uh, the key advisor to DEFRA and to the Department for International Trade on food safety issues. And we also um, are represented directly at Codex Alimentarius, which is the international body where international standards on food safety and, and international guidelines are set. And this is a reference body which the World Trade Organization also um, refers to a lot. And we are committed to sharing information openly, as openly as possible across the um, FSA, so within our three nations in the Food Standards Agency and also with Food Standards Scotland as those positions are developed. And that is set out in the Memorandum of Understanding between the Food Standards Agency and Food Standards Scotland. Um, uh, so uh, the, the intention of all of that is to make sure that international obligations, when they are entered into, uh, account for um, the realities on the ground in the four nations of the UK. And I should emphasise, and Maria may want to supplement, that um, because we have a Northern Ireland office of the Food Standards Agency and a Northern Ireland director, we have directly funded staff from the Northern Ireland executive um, budget, uh, it, it, and, and we have our stakeholder engagement um, provisions in Northern Ireland. It does mean that the Northern Ireland perspective is well, um, is well represented in our discussions with DIT, with DEFRA, and indeed, um, with Codex uh, and elsewhere. Uh, the other thing, I, uh, the next thing I wanted to mention was this, this question about whether um, there was going to be a sufficiently UK-wide UK basis to protect human health. I think this is particularly important that I, I want to emphasise with the committee. So whilst it's true that um, Northern Ireland will be following the EU uh, rules, um, what we have committed to doing at the Food Standards Agency is to take account of Northern Irish consumers and their experiences um, of food in our own risk analysis process. So as we consider the products um, that are being applied for, for, for authorization, we will be looking at the specific consumption habits in Northern Ireland as we would in Wales, as we would in England. And that will inform both our own uh, recommendations to ministers about whether those products should be authorized, but also it will inform any representations we may want to, to make to the EU. So if, if you take, for example, uh, something like orange squash, which um, in the UK, it tends to be drunk more by children than it might do in the rest of the EU. In the rest of the EU, it's often used as a sports drink, perhaps not some, such a high consumption by children. So that's a specific consumption habit um, of certain additives of, of, certain, uh, of a certain product. We would want to make sure that that experience and that understanding was being fed to the EU um, for their consideration of an additive that might end up in orange squash, for instance, so that Northern Irish consumers' experiences could be reflected in both places. Um, you, you also asked which areas are under threat of divergence. I, I think um, I think divergence, it, it, the intention of the frameworks is for there not to be divergence, they're meant to be common. But as you've noted, the Northern Ireland Protocol does create a situation where, um, because Northern Ireland tracks the EU rules, um, there is very likely to be change. Um, I, I think the ones I would identify early are, first of all, uh, as I mentioned, the regulated products process where applicants can apply um, in terms of novel foods or additives for authorization. I, I don't think there'll be an intention for there to be a divergence there. I think it's very likely that we track each other. Um, but it's possible that timescales could mean that um, that, that uh, something is authorised first in the UK or, or f first in the EU. Um, if you take, for example, um, or over the next 10 years, 
uh, I suspect there will be various insect-based products that will be applying for authorization, so mealworm and so on. Um, and it may be that a business applies um, into the EU market but doesn't apply to the UK or vice versa. Um, another example might be around um, the, the safety of uh, products of animal origin and particularly um, uh, the, the hygiene requirements that we put into place for official controls in uh, meat abattoirs. At the moment, um, the, the EU regime, which we've inherited into the UK, um, is quite prescriptive about both the outcomes and the ways in which you achieve those outcomes. And we're very interested at looking at whether the official controls can be done with the same outcome, but with a bit more flexibility about who might be undertaking the particular checks. Um, so, so for, or where the people are, like, does it need an official vet to be on the premises or can the check be done under supervision of the official vet at a distance? So those sorts of things we'll be, we'll be looking at. And um, I know that the EU has been developing some reforms to their own official controls process. It may be that those two things, um, those two things run, run uh, not in parallel. Um, and then I think that the last area will be um, that I think there will be potentially totemic questions where um, uh, GB and uh, the EU are potentially in different places because they have different interpretations of the science. Uh, the one that uh, emerged earlier this year, obviously, is gene editing, where the English government has put out a consultation on that. I, on that, um, it, it, I just want to emphasise that before any kind of gene edited product was put onto the market, um, the Food Standards Agency would need to do an assessment of safety, and that assessment has not yet happened. So we are not able to comment on the safety or not of, of gene editing. But you, you can see that those sorts of issues, there may end up being divergence if um, there were different approaches to the science. That's helpful. Emily, can, Emily can, can you comprehend how offensive it is to somebody of my persuasion as a unionist in Northern Ireland to, to see these potential divergence and even the impact that the Northern Ireland Protocol has had in the, in the initial stages? I think references to things like soil, for example, seed potatoes. We could go on the list as endless. You have named a number of potential products where you could see divergence in the future. But can you understand how difficult that is going to be in Northern Ireland, given uh, the current situation with the Northern Ireland Protocol? Uh, uh, indeed, uh, and I, I feel like it's it's not for me or the FSA to comment on the Northern Ireland Protocol or the arrangements that are in law. We we have to apply um, what's been established through the treaties and in law. So I'm doing my best to communicate what I think the implications are. But I do appreciate that it's it's difficult. Okay, thank thank you. So uh, Carol, then Carol Nichelen, go ahead, Carol. <clears throat> Can you hear me, Chair? I'm hearing you. Yes, go ahead, Charles. Uh, it's just my um, my connection is very unstable. Um, first of all, Emily and Maria, thank you very much, not only for the written material as a new member in the committee, I find it quite helpful, um, but also your your response thus far. Um, can I just clarify that even as you've laid out, some of, most of these issues are reserved matters. Um, and there's still um, a, a recognition, indeed, an, an adherence or, or an honouring the EU directives on this as well. That's my first question. Um, and one implications of any, you know, given some of the commentary um, from some unionists around uh, the North South, not just the East West relations, but also the North South in terms of North, the, the All Ireland bodies. Well, let's have an application for that arrangement. And then, you know, suppose, you know, this isn't, you know, what what were the arrangements regarding soil and biosecurity um, up until now? You know, what difference is there, if any? Um, and then my last is really just, I suppose, a comment that, you know, I, I find it quite disturbing to hear Jonathan using language like direct action. Um, I don't know what that means, but I would just ask people, you know, just not to get involved in hyperbole here um, because things need to be calmed down and this sort of commentary isn't helpful. So maybe I'd like to clarify that. I appreciate that's not a question for Emily and Maria. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. 
Um, thank you, Carol. And uh, yes, go ahead, Emily, please. Thank you. Uh, Carol, sorry, I didn't quite catch your first question about the EU directives. Would you mind repeating that? Can you hear me, Chair? Yes, just yeah, hearing so, you now, yeah. So sorry, Emily, the first question was why you laid out that many of these issues are reserved matters between DEFRA and and others. Um, what I would like to know is that given the responsibility to meet the EU directives, what, what burn, if any, do they have on those? And then what relationship, if any, or what impact, if any, will this have? Because we've heard a lot about East-West relations and indeed some threats about North-South uh, relations. But, you know, so that's the EU directives. And then what impact, if any, would it have on the All-Ireland body, the, you know, in terms of food safety? So, um, so I th is that, is that, is that okay? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Carol. Sorry for not catching that first time around. So, um, so yes, trade is reserved, but food and feed matters are devolved. Um, and uh, so the choices, um, so, you know, for example, Wales can, can make its own choices about food labeling, um, about uh, um, whether to authorize a product. Um, now, the, the, because it's devolved and because until December 2020, um, there was the EU framework sitting above it all, ensuring that there was alignment. That's why we've established these frameworks um, uh, to ensure we have a process to try and get to a single approach as possible across the four nations. Um, so, the, so in effect, the, the Northern Ireland will be changing its rules um, in line with the EU. We will be keeping up with that and making judgments about whether um, that should be things that we recommend to English and Welsh and Scottish ministers at the same time. Um, I, hope, I hope that answers that question. On, on the oil island um, arrangement, so um, we have a, a very strong collaborative relationship with the Food Safety Authority of Ireland, which we've set out in a memorandum of understanding. We're, we're currently reviewing that MOU across both organisations because we're conscious that these new arrangements need to be reflected in it. Um, and we meet regularly with the FSA in Ireland as set out in our current MOU to discuss issues like incident management, um, nutrition labelling, dietary health. Um, in May 2020, we discussed the importance of the development of the common frameworks for agreed policy making across the UK with uh, senior management officials from both organisations. And then I should also mention that there is uh, the body Safe Food, which is a cross-border body created under terms of the Good Friday Agreement, which is tasked with promoting food safety and healthy eating on an all-island basis. And the FSA works with Safe Food and other relevant government departments um, to ensure cross-border collaboration and consistency of approach and consumer messaging where, where possible. Um, and, and Maria may, may want, want to say a bit more about that. Uh, the soil and bi biosecurity question and what difference is there, if any? I'm, I'm going to ask Maria to pick up that one, if that's okay. Thank you. Thank you, Emily. Okay, Maria. Thanks, Emily. Um, yes, just, just to reassure the committee, um, we have built really strong and resilient relationships, working relationships with the Food Safety Authority of Ireland over the 20 years that both bodies have been working together. Um, and, you know, for example, we've carried out joint exercises with them. We have shared intelligence. We have um, delivered conferences together. Um, we've also gathered scientific evidence across the island. Um, and we have regular um, official working groups that look at specific issues and also, you know, touch base on a regular basis, just in general, on the work that's going on. Now, in anticipation of the new working arrangements between the UK um, and the EU, we have, as Emily says, been reviewing the MOU and protocols for, for example, data sharing, um, how we communicate and also incident handling are all being refreshed and renewed so that um, the new arrangements will be taken into account. Um, we also um, similarly work very closely with Safe Food. And as you know, um, Safe Food has um, you know, a particular remit in Northern Ireland. Um, we make sure that um, we have representation on Safe Food's working groups 
um, when Safe Food is thinking about doing um, some science or evidence gathering. Um, we work very closely with them to make sure that they get it right um, for Northern Ireland consumers. And that evidence then we can feed into the FSA. So it's additional evidence that we have when we're having these conversations about risk assessment and risk management. Um, and then just finally, um, in relation to biosecurity, um, biosecurity has always been a big issue. Um, it's, it's a DARA lead in Northern Ireland. Um, but in fairness, we work very closely with DARA to make sure that there aren't food safety risks. Um, and if we identify food safety risks, then we will deal with those food safety risks on an all island basis. May I just come in with one other point? Uh, you, were, some, you were asking earlier who was on the um, food industry liaison group for Northern Ireland, and I've just been able to fish out the, the details. So we have the Northern Ireland Meat Exporters Association, the Livestock and Meat Commission, the Northern Ireland Pork and Bacon Forum, the Ulster Farmers Union, the Northern Ireland Food and Drink Association, the Northern Ireland Poultry Industry Federation, Dairy UK, Invest at Northern Ireland, and Northern Ireland Grain and Trade Association. Thank you. That's that's helpful, Emily. Thank you, Carol. Are you uh, are you content then, or have you anything further before we move on to Paula? No. Um, I th I thank you for that. Um, but I do think um, we do need some clarification on a lot of issues. So I appreciate you'll get a lot of questions and a lot of suggestions. So we'll come back to it at the end. But thank you very much. Thank you. And going then to Paula Bradshaw. Go ahead, Paula, please. Um, thank you, ladies, for um, coming before committee again today. I think uh, you may just have answered my question. There. It was really around engagement um, with the sort of smaller um, producers, manufacturers. I think that um, the last time you were here, I'm not sure whether I'm putting words in your mouth, but whether you said you, you didn't actually have personnel operating in Northern Ireland. Um, and I'm just wondering about whether that is happening and how much you're actually engaging with um I say the small producers because at the minute they're dealing with COVID, they're dealing with pressures within their workforce in terms of self-isolating and etc. It's really just about how we're supporting the, the very, very small people at the at the far end of the food chain who are obviously feeling a lot of pressure at the minute. Thank you. Thank you, Paula. Thank you. Yes, but we do have people in Northern Ireland. I'll let Maria describe the rather large office of people that she's got. Maria, over to you. Thank you very much. Yes, Paul, I'm not sure um, uh, how um, that, that was picked up last time round. Apologies for that. We do have a, quite a big team in Belfast and actually the team is growing um, because um, of the, the capacity and capability that we require um, to do the work that we need to do um, post EU exit. But um, we do rely on the trade bodies to a certain extent. It's very, very difficult, as you know, to reach some of those um, SMEs. And we rely on NIFTA a lot. So NIFTA puts out a lot of our communication to it directly to their membership. Um, and also we rely on Invest NI and Invest NI puts up an, an awful lot of information for businesses on um, their, um, their business info um, site as well. Uh, but as well as that, we have been working with businesses um, on a number of issues and we um, work through Lockery College um, and we touch base with the knowledge providers um, that, that work with food, the food industry and advise the food industry. Um, so we would very regularly go along to industry meetings at that um, Lockery College and, and their um, people would set up. So we use the mechanisms that are, I suppose, in place in Northern Ireland as much as we can to get directly to SMEs. Um, we've also been involved with the, the recent DERA web, webcasts about the new arrangements and also, um, you know, we have been as much as possible open and accessible um, to, get, to get information out through our own, you know, website, you know, Twitter accounts, all of that. So we try um, through all the various channels to reach the industry uh, as well as we can do. Thank you. I think it was maybe around the engagement event. Maybe I picked that up wrong um, incorrectly. But I suppose I'm, I'm wondering then, you know, it's one thing sending information out through a network. I'm just wondering, are you doing any evaluation 
going straight to SMEs and saying, look, what is the best way for us to communicate with you directly, given the pressures you're feeling at this time? Because sometimes we think the citizens have sent an email that the job's done, but a lot of the times they're, they go on red. Yeah. No, I totally agree with you. Um, it's, it, it is really difficult to get out to businesses, especially with the pressures that they're facing at the minute, you know, from all, all of the different fronts. And actually, you know, they, they get bombarded um, f from right across government um, for, for, you know, for different things that the government wants them to, to, to deal with. Um, and actually, one of the things that we picked up from our stakeholders was, don't bother us in the last couple of months. Please do not send us anything that isn't directly EU exit related or COVID-19 related because they're, they're just under so much pressure. Um, but we do continue to tap into those um, uh, those networks that we have and make sure that we're getting as much coverage as we possibly can just under the circumstances that we're facing at the minute. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, thank you for that. Um, so listen now, we, we will maybe want to have a quick discussion here as a as a committee on on relation to that, but also I'm conscious that we have the other the other framework, which is the uh, and we've already received a briefing for that the FS FFSH, and I will just ask members um, if they have any additional questions in relation to to that framework, um, and then and then we can consider we can consider the two frameworks. So, for my own point of view in relation to the FFSH. Um, do you, do you consider that that framework takes account of the protocol and do you envisage any issues emerging or are there issues emerging already at this stage? So, so for the food, feed, safety and hygiene uh, framework, it, it accounts for the protocol it's, it's written in. Uh, for the nutrition related labelling composition standards framework that you considered um, in the autumn, that was written, I think it had been written uh, many months before and it didn't sufficiently account for the Northern Ireland Protocol. So it is going to be um, updated to reflect the obligations in, in the Northern Ireland Protocol. So for instance, it needs to make it clear that there is more chance of divergence um, than was expected. And we will basically import the language we've used in the food, feed and hygiene and safety framework into the nutrition related composition and standards framework. Um, it, we also need to reiterate in the nutrition framework the commitment to a four nation approach in terms of policy consideration and, and governance and dispute resolution. And we need to uh, stress in particular Northern Ireland's continued participation in risk management considerations. So we want to make sure that the nutrition framework properly sort of aligns with what we're doing on food and feed safety. Okay, thank you. And I have an indication then from Alan. Alan, do you have a question on either of the frameworks, please? Yes, Chairman, can you hear me okay? Yes, I'm hearing you there okay, Alan, thank you. It's just uh, Emily had said earlier in her presentation about uh, if producers were looking for um, authorization for maybe new products or, or a change of ingredients, etc., uh, that the two agencies would take a look at it, the uh, European agency and our, our own agency. Uh, and she did say that it's unlikely uh, that they would ever have a difference of opinion. But, uh, you know, never say never. Uh, if, if, in fact, there were any difference uh, of opinion uh, on issuing an authorization in those circumstances, uh, where would the uh, primacy of decision making lie? Would it lie with the uh, European side or with our own? side and does this sort of approach of two agencies looking at, at, at new products and stuff um, it, with, knowing that the EU have a reputation, uh, reputation that they don't do things very quickly at times uh, would, they, would you anticipate any timeline delays because of this uh, sort of twin track approach Yeah so um, the, in Northern Ireland the EU arrangements have primacy um, and there is a possibility of uh, difference of timescales, as I, as I said earlier. Um, the the uh, issue, if, if there is a dissatisfaction, if Northern Irish ministers, for instance, are unhappy with um, a decision that the EU has taken and how it applies in Northern Ireland, you would have to use the arrangements through, um, through uh, the, the Joint Committee to raise those um, between uh, uh, 
um, Northern Ireland and the EU. Um, but the thing I would, so that obviously is quite a nuclear situation and we would hope that that wouldn't happen. Um, the, the arrangements that we're setting out in the framework are intended to try and prevent that from happening. So um, the risk analysis that we're doing, the consideration and so on, we, we will be putting our advice to Northern Irish ministers on that so that they're aware of what's going on and they can use the arrangements for um, consultation and so on with the EU appropriately. Thank you. Okay. Okay, thank you, members. Um, I think that's, that's everyone who has sought to come in with a question for that. So um, I just want to once again thank Emily and um, Maria for attending our meeting today and for answering questions for members. Um, and I know we will we will uh, we will likely uh, be seeing you be seeing you again as this all um, works works its way through. But I want to thank you very much for coming to the committee this morning and to wish you all the best of luck. Thank you very much. Really appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. Okay. Bye. Okay, members, thank you. Um, so, to go on then, members, to uh, have members any further comments or issues they wish to raise? Okay, so um, if, if members are then content with the framework or wish to note the framework for committee, um, are members content to note the framework at this at this time? Great. Yeah, okay. Members agreed. Okay, thank you. Um moving on then to the second framework. So that, that was in relation to the first one, which was a uh, the uh, just looking for the actual detail there. Provisional framework on food and feed safely and hygiene that's that one so we're moving on then to the second one which is the one on nutrition so i can remind members that uh, the committee heard from the food standards agency on the nutrition labeling and composition of standards common framework in november and also from the department of health during the committee's last briefing on brexit the committee has also received correspondence from the house of lords common framework scrutiny committee and from the relevant committees in the scottish parliament and the welsh assembly as well as from the committee for the executive office here in the assembly that correspondence is included at tab six of your packs can i remind members uh, we, we we have uh, had the, the members online there so are the officials online do members have any further issues or comments what to raise or make in relation to that framework um yeah members members content so just just in relation to the previous one before I go on, can, can I just check if the committee is content to write to the department to advise it as noted and outline our scrutiny of that? Are members content with that in addition to the first one? Yeah, thank you. So then returning to the one on nutrition, then are members similarly content to write to the minister to advise as it, it notes the proposed framework, outlines the committee's consideration and request that it, it be kept updated on progress? Are members content with that approach? Yeah. Um, okay, so members, that that does uh, that takes us to the end of that section. We do need to get officials on the line for the next uh, the next part of our meeting. It may not be possible to get them on um, in in terms of timing. They were they were due around half eleven. We'll check. We'll take a short break now and we'll check if we can get them online. If not, when we come back, I will propose that we move to correspondence if there's a delay in getting those officials online. But I propose now that we take a, a fifteen minute break there and come back at eleven ten to continue the session if members are content with that. Thank you, members. This is the Northern That's a slide now, Chair. Okay, thank you, members. So we will uh, resume our, our this morning's meeting of the Health Committee then in public session with item seven, which is SR two thousand and two zero two one forward slash eight, the Mental Health nineteen eighty six order amendment order NA twenty twenty one, and I refer members there to papers at tab seven of the pack. This SR members extends the period of time which must elapse for a second opinion to be required for the continued administration of medicine to detain patients from three to six months. Members will remember that the committee was briefed on this SR and other temporary amendments to the mental health order at last week's meeting, 
but deferred its consideration of the SR pending further information from the department and the report from the examiner of statutory rules. I can advise members that a response has been received from the department and is at page two of your table of papers. The response provides further information on staff absence and increased demand for mental health provision. That response also provides the department's reasons for the SR not including a sunset clause. The department has committed to providing periodic updates to the committee in relation to the extension and how that's being operated. So I can advise that Mr. Thomas Adele is available to respond to any further issues members may wish to raise on that matter, or it may be the case that members are now content with the clarification and unwilling to consider. So can members just indicate if anyone, so I do see an indication there from Orlea Flynn. So can we, uh, can we get uh, Tomo Tomas into the spotlight and then I'll go to Orlea and I have Jonathan there indicating as well. Good morning, Thomas, can you hear me okay? Good morning, I can hear you fine, yeah. Thank, Thomas. thank you, Thomas, and to Falsha Road to this morning's meeting. Once again, thank you back to our committee. So I'd now like to welcome Mr. Thomas Adele, who is the Adult Mental Health Unit, uh, uh, within, from the Adult Mental Health Unit in the Department of Health. So, Thomas, we have an indication here from a couple of members who have further questions. We appreciate that you briefed us on this last week and have provided some updates. So I'll go first of all to Orlea Flynn. Go ahead, Orlea. Thank you, Chair. Um Thanks, Thomas, and appreciate the, the detail that um, we received in our table packs from some of the questions last week. Um, but I was just wondering on the, the table that we've got around the numbers of staff that are currently absent from work or self-isolating, um, would it be possible to, you know, I know it's given us the, the numbers, but would it be possible to get a sense of, so like for Belfast Trust, there's 18 staff absent due to COVID, but 18 out of how many, you know, so we, we, we sort of know what proportion um, that is. And I mean, I have to say that some of the, in the, the breakdown um, in the table papers um, around table one, where you have listed <clears throat> the number of immediate pressures um, that's, obviously that the <clears throat> excuse me that the inpatient units are under at the moment um you know some of that is really really stark uh there was one point that really jumped out at me i think was it the western trust um are currently unable to admit female patients um due to the covid-19 pressures which is is you know i mean that's that's really frightening um and so you can you can see looking down that list Absolutely, the pressures that, that the, the mental health inpatient units are under. Um, I think one of the other um, bullet points was talking about, you know, the levels of people uh, requiring um, requiring that, that sort of inpatient treatment, that it's 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 doubled um, in some cases. So, you know, I, I do understand the, the pressures that you are facing. And I think that, you know, with the right, a lot of the rationale that you gave last week about extending uh, that time period for, uh, receiving the the second medication, I think that's understandable. But I wonder, Thomas, how would it be practical for? I know you had said last week that you are going to be doing weekly meetings. What would be the easiest way for you to communicate that um, back to the committee? Because it would definitely be something that um, I think we should be receiving regular updates around, just to see how many times the measures have been required, um, and to sort of keep track if they're if they're still uh, necessary. But I appreciate all the detail that you give us, Thomas. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, th th thank you very much. I, I have, I'm very happy to be as frank as, as we need to be um, because it, it is quite stark figures. I, I can provide anyone assurance. Western Trust might not be able to admit female patients. We can, anyone who needs admitted have been admitted. Um, they might not have been in the closest hospital and they might not have been in the right uh, trust. But there has been we've been able to admit everyone um, because the trust has been working really hard to make sure that that has been possible. So I can provide that assurance to you. Uh, I'm provided happy to provide updates as you you would want it. Providing updates every week uh, I can do. It might not be that helpful for you because it might not be that much in from week to week. Uh, it might be easier to provide updates every two weeks or so in in a written letter to you. I, I have no promise doing that. If that would be helpful to you. Thanks very much, Thomas. 
Yes, thank thank you, Thomas, and, and uh, I think I think the committee would appreciate that. So we'll touch on that at the end just to confirm. But thank you for that. So going then to Jonathan, please. We're not hearing Jonathan at the moment. So just checking again, is Jonathan, are you online with us there? Okay, I'm going to move on to the next, and I'll come back to Jonathan. So I'm going to move on to Carol and then I'll go to Pam. But if Jonathan's back online, I'll go back to him at, at that point. Go ahead, uh, Carol, please. Thank, thank you, Chair, and thank you, Thomas. Um, again, I'm just new to this. I find the information quite helpful. Um, it's just some of the questions that hopefully we'll be able to answer. First of all, I'm concerned at the, at the at obviously the um, outcome that this will have, but primarily, you know, given the fact that inpatient, in, inpatient beds were removed in Holywell, uh, you know, what impact that would have. And secondly, was there an equality impact assessment done on this as well? Um, because I, I do believe, like given the fact, particularly around women, um, that there's there's um, we're, we're in danger of breaching our, our equality um, rights. So I'll just leave it at that. Yeah, we we screened the second opinion um, time period, and that did not have a negative impact, a significant negative impact, a minor negative impact um, that can be mitigated against. When it comes to the uh, enable to admit women in the Western Trust, it, it is not a, a policy decision. It, it is a matter of fact that because of outbreaks on the female wards in Grangewood, there simply isn't anywhere to admit the woman. Um, it's it's not, um, it, it's it's not it's not a desired position at all. That's that's just reality we're facing. And um, the trust have been working very hard to make sure that everyone can be admitted and needs to be admitted, and um, the trust has been cooperating well. So if someone is admitted from Grangewood in in the northwest and can't be admitted, we find the closest available place for that. Which often is in Causeway or Holloway when they can admit, or in Oma in Toronto of Manor Hospital, which is which is also in the Western Trust. So we will be trying our very best to make sure service patients are available. It is just very very difficult with the current pressures. Chair, yes, Carol, go ahead. Um, to Tomasa, I appreciate what you're saying, but quality screening and a quality impact assessments are two different things. And I do think this did need a, an, an EQIA on it. Um, and then just in relation to the question around Holywell, what, what is the situation there, given that those inpatient beds were closed? Um, the, we had four outbreaks in Holywell. They're not four have been declared over yet, but two of the wards haven't had no um, positive patients for the last 10 days, so they can admit patients again. Two wards still have um, COVID patients and therefore can't accept admissions. But people can be admitted to Hollowell if needed at the moment. But I mean that that's due to COVID and infection control uh, reasons. It, it's not the decision we want to take. We simply don't want to admit patients into ward where there's active COVID outbreaks. Okay, Carol. Yeah. Okay. Listen, I'm going to I'm going to go ahead then to um, Pam Cameron. Pam, could you go ahead, please? Yeah. Thanks, Chair. Um, thanks, Thomas. Um, and I suppose just in the back of Carl's question around Hollywell, there, um, it uh, that's pretty concerning. So, are you sorry? Just for clarity, did you say there's no there's been no positive cases amongst patients in the last ten days? And on, on two of the wards, there's been no positive cases um, among patients for the last 10 days. Um, and in the other wards, there have been cases, there have been outbreaks, there have been new cases detected within the last 10 days. At least that's up their head on Tuesday. Um, and therefore, they don't ex um, admit new patients to those wards. One patient are coming in new to those wards. They've been kept in an admission area and screened for COVID. So, so make sure they don't mix with the general population on the wards. Um, but but it, it's it's... It's one of those things. If you have an outbreak on a ward, we will also need to minimize the risk to everyone and not admitting new patients into the another COVID exist COVID environment. Okay, that's yeah. I, I understand that's very difficult to manage. Um do, do we know? I mean, obviously there was fifty-eight staff affected with COVID in, in Hollywell. Do we know 
what the um, cause of the transmission was. Did, did, was there any investigation as, as to how so many contracted it? The there is some thinking. I mean, we don't have any conclusive evidence, and we think there might be some different um, mechanisms on the different routes in. We know that some a couple of patients in the dementia ward in the older age psychiatry wards, they came from uh, physical health hospitals, and it was believed that they um, either were admitted into physical health hospital with COVID or uh, became COVID positive in those hospitals because they were tested very shortly after admission into Hollowell. Um, so they wouldn't have been able to acquire it in Hollowell. Um, the staff outbreaks, it's we. Th 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 there's a suspicion that there might be some patient to staff transmission, and some pa staff to staff transmission, but obviously because community transmission is fairly high as well, it's really hard, it's hard to determine whether that's as uh, staff being um, becoming COVID positive in hospital when, when they work in hospital, or if this is happening in the community through social interactions they have uh, outside hospital. Okay, and then that leads me to asking if if um, testing is happening then from before patients are transferred from one part of a hospital to another part of a hospital. Uh, that seemed to be pretty important given your answer there, Thomas. Um, and I would also like to ask you around the the uh, the rate of uptake of the vaccine by members of staff in particular um, within this mental health issue. And you know, do we know what percentage of staff have taken up the offer of vaccine? And if that's not enough, um, to encourage those to to make sure that they do go ahead and, and get a vaccine in order to protect the services that are there. Yeah, uh, all patients are tested when they're admitted, and there's testing procedures in line with infection control. Um, so, so they're tested in line with all, all current guidance and procedures, and they're tested regularly. So the test, th that's how we're picking up some of these cases. Most of the patient, most of the staff have been tested positive, have been asymptomatic, so they've not been unwell. Okay. Um, but and they've picked up through regular testing, which is obviously a very good thing. Um, but it obviously pause, causes pressures on the system. When it comes to vaccination uptakes, I don't have numbers for staff mental health services, other than trust reporting that's good uptake. Um, I, I am not come across any um, any views that mental health staff on the inpatient wards are not accepting the vaccine. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I can probably find out exact details for you, but I haven't haven't had any concerns on the trust about the uptake in those areas. Yeah, I, I think that would be good to get those figures uh, um, because obviously, you know, avoiding close contacts, obviously very, very difficult within those um, hospital settings and in particular in the mental health unit so i think that it would be good to have that detail if you don't mind and i suppose to just to make a comment that um that amount of asymptomatic cases really does highlight the problem that we have in the community and trying to control this far so that's i'm just i'm just making a comment that that the fact that if all those 58 people were asymptomatic that demonstrates how difficult it is to control the virus and, and they need to be very cautious in the community too. So thank you. Okay, thank you. And can I just check with the clerk? I think uh, Jonathan appears to have dropped off the call there at this point in time. We haven't managed to, uh, he hasn't gone back on. So I think I think what we'll do if, if uh, if Jonathan had has any questions that he wishes to submit, maybe uh, Thomas, if you're content, we we'll forward those on for consideration. But we'll go ahead and uh, and and make our substantive consideration. So before, just to let John Thomas away, uh, clerk, is is Jonathan available online or not? No, he's he's not on the call at the minute, chair. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Clerk. So listen, Thomas, thank you for that. If there are subsequent questions, we can forward them through and um, we, we'll, we'll make our, our consideration now, um, but we can let you go for now. Thanks, Thomas. Yes, go Sorry, ahead, Chair. Can I, can I just ask, Thomas, was a, a Quality or Human Rights Commission consulted in this? Because it's seen that the PHA, the Health and Social Care Trusts were and other professional bodies, and it says others, were they included as others? We have not discussed it with the Quality Commission or Human Rights Commission, no. Okay, and, and 
in relation in relation to that, a follow a follow up to that, would that not be a very obvious a uh, thing to do, Thomas? Given that the time doesn't allow for some of the 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 what would be necessary equality screening in in issues like this, would that not appear to be? And would you would you commit that that will happen in the future? We we have com- we conduct an equality screening in line with normal procedures. Um, and obviously, the Quality Commission will be informed of that in, the, in line with normal procedures. So we have, in essence, followed the, what, what we usually do on these things. Um, when we have significant equality human rights concerns, we involve the Human Rights Commission uh, as it's appropriate to do so. And that, that's been done in the past, and I'm quite happy to commit to do that again, because that's something we, we do. Okay. Orlea, I see your hand raised. Is that, are you looking in again, Orlea, or is that from previous... Uh, no, it was. I had forgot to mention earlier just about um, the the report from the examiner of statutory rules. If have I missed it in the pack, or did we get that? We have the report, and and the examiner has indicated that it was in breach of the normal twenty one day process. But she's content with that, and otherwise content with the with the with the rule. Okay, thank you, chair. Okay, okay. Anything finally then for Thomas before we let him go. Okay, Thomas, thank you, um, and good luck. Thank you for your attendance at this morning's committee. Okay, members, any further comments uh, members wish to make in relation to that or suggestions? Chair, sure, I think we do need to um, talk to the Human Rights Commission and the Equality Commission on this. I think it is quite surprising that they weren't consulted in this, you know, given that it's a mental health order. It's actually the legislation, and I don't accept the fact that it was screened out rather than EQIA, and I don't accept that they should the both Equality and Human Rights Commission uh, that the department felt that they didn't need to consult with them. I would really uh, implore people to consider t- doing just that. I think this is this is um, shocking to be frank. Yeah, I think I think there are issues. Actually, there had been there had been um, contact made with the with the the previous clerk with the Human Rights uh, Commission that we were, were going to speak to him. In the changeover, that hasn't happened. But maybe um, now I'm also conscious that this is the final opportunity to consider this uh, this SR and the impact of it of people not receiving their medication in the circumstances would potentially be quite severe in that sense. So I think we need to we need to strike a balance and i'm wondering would it be in order for me to suggest that i would have a conversation with the with with the commission to take their view on it and then put put this to the members by email later on today to to see if members are content to affirm the rule based on based on that because i do think it's right and and that was something we did want to do it is just uh, it has just not been possible to do it in, in the way things work out would members have members any other comments or any other suggestions in relation to that, or in the case, yeah. Chair, can I just support your um, suggestion that you have that conversation and then um, update us and ask us the question by email later? We'll have enough of that. So, members, content with that approach? Are you? Great. Okay. Thank you, members. Okay. So I, I, I yes, yeah, so we'll ask the question formally via email later on if members can. Is, is that an order, clerk, to do that, or do we put the question now, subject to that conversation? Um, I think ideally we would want it subject to that conversation, but um, I'll just uh, if you, if you give me a wee minute, I can check the date because I think at the end of statutory period is the sixteenth of February, which okay. might mean we could bring it back next week. Um, do you agree okay. formally? So it is, but I'll I'll come back to you on that chair once um. I've confirmed that. Okay. Um, and should we should we therefore move on to the to the other the travel regulations and come back to this at the end? If you've att- would you have yeah, without that, that, that would be great, Chair. So we'd have a good move on to the travel regs. Okay, and that obviously would be the optimum if we can afford to bring it back next week. That would be the optimum. Um, but we'll we'll consider the other thing if it's not if it's not possible. So if members are content, then I'll I'll pause that for now and return to that afterwards, and we'll move on then to the travel regulations. And we do have a, an official, I believe, on the line for that. So are members content for me to move on? Yeah, thank you, members. 
Okay, members, we're now moving then to consideration of six statutory rules on coronavirus international travel restrictions. I can advise members that departmental officials are here to brief the committee on the regulations and to take questions. We will then consider each SR in turn. The examiner of statutory rules has reported that all the following rules were laid in breach of the 21-day rule, but that she is satisfied that the department has provided a satisfactory reason for those breaches. I refer members to the clerk's memo, which is a tab 8.1. A departmental official is here today to brief the committee on the provisions contained in these regulations. So I would now like to welcome and ask broadcasting to bring into the spotlight and to welcome Miss Elaine Colgan. And I'll just wait to check that Elaine's online. Good morning, Elaine, and welcome. Can you hear me okay? Yes, thank you. Yeah, can you hear me? Yep, yep, thank you. So I'd now like to welcome by video link Miss Elaine Colgan, Chief of Staff to the Chief Medical Officer. To Fulcherot, Elaine, Gujia and Rin Slancha, Marjean Shaw. You're very welcome, Elaine, back again to the committee. And uh, I would like to now invite you to go ahead and brief the members on this morning's on those SRs. Thank you. Uh, good morning, uh, Chair and members, and thank you for the opportunity to discuss uh, the recent amendments to the international travel regulations. So I will briefly outline the changes made by each of the six sets of regulations. There is a fair amount to cover in these, not just in terms of the number of regs, but also in terms of the policy changes that they introduced. So I will be as brief as I can, and I'm, I'm more than happy to elaborate on any of these further if helpful. And Elaine, sorry, 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 Elaine, just, just sorry to cut across you. Uh, it is sometimes a little bit of difficulty with hearing, so if you could just keep it quite slow, just, just to assist members in understanding. Thank you. No problem, thanks. The first three sets of regulations didn't contain any major policy changes beyond the regular review of countries. The first one, SR number four for 2021, which was the first amendment this year, uh, removed Botswana, Israel, Jerusalem, Mauritius and Seychelles from the travel corridor. It also introduced a new Schedule 5, which is a list of countries subject to additional measures. Uh, South Africa was already subject to these measures prior to this amendment, so this restructured the regulations as we were adding more countries, and that included many of the Southern African countries uh, and added those to the same restrictions. So if you had traveled through one of those listed countries in the pre previous 14 days, you had to self-isolate for 10 days along with the members of your household. And the sectoral exemptions were also removed when traveling from those countries. That amendment also removed some sporting competitions from the list in Schedule 4, which allows the exemption from self-isolation for competitions. The second amendment, SR 2021 number 5, removed the UAE from the travel corridors and required passengers transiting through there and arriving from there to self-isolate for 10 days. The third regulation, number six, 2021, um, was to remove Aruba, the Azores, and the other Caribbean and South American countries from the travel corridors list. And uh, it also asked added uh, many of the South American countries to Schedule 5, which is the country subject to the additional measures. And the reason for this was the information that was received about the new Brazilian variant at the time and the need to reduce the risk of this entering the UK. We also updated the sporting competitions in Schedule 4. I'd just like to pause a little bit and focus on the reason for this change on the variants. So this was the second major variant from overseas and it sparked a holistic consideration of the travel policy more broadly. Um, so the next set of amendments was in response to that increased threat of new variants and was introduced to allow time to consider the future approach of travel. When the regulations were first introduced back in June last year, it was with the aim of mitigating against the risk of imported cases generally, noting that this was of most impact when Northern Ireland cases were low. When cases are high, the number of imported cases is a smaller proportion of the overall number, so there is less impact from travel. However, in the context of variants, the situation is slightly different. When new variants emerge, we don't always know as much as we would like to about them and about their impacts. So the aim becomes preventing any cases really of those variants entering Northern Ireland rather than simply minimizing numbers. 
So the suspension of the travel corridors was to give time for a review of the policy and regulations in this context to determine what the aim of the policy should be and whether it was appropriate in the current situation and ensure that the measures were sufficiently robust but also proportionate and able to meet this new challenge. The review is ongoing and includes a full review of all sectoral exemptions and this is um, that are in place at the moment. All regions of the UK are reviewing their own sectoral exemptions in a localised context, which is probably more further localised than we've done before. So the, the amendment in question was number 9, 2021. The travel corridors for all countries was suspended from the 18th of January until at least the 15th of February. It removed a number of sectoral exemptions completely, uh, advertising, high-end TV and TV production generally, journalism and the amendment associated with the national lottery competition. This was and is a temporary measure while we review the international travel regulations in the context of the emerging threat. The next significant policy change quickly followed that one, and that was the introduction of the requirement to have a negative test prior to arrival in Northern Ireland from outside of the common travel area. And that was introduced by SR number 10, 2021. It required a test to have been taken within 20, 72 hours of departure and a negative result received. The penalty for failing to have the negative test results started at £500 and increased, according to subsequent defences, up to £4,000 for passengers. Some exemptions and reasonable excuses does apply, and there is also a, a very small number of sectoral exemptions. The test must have a sensitivity of at least 80% and a specificity of at least 97%. The regulations require operators to check for the, that the test has been completed prior to boarding and they may refuse boarding for passengers who do not have this test result. If operators fail to comply with this requirement, they may commit an offence and they may be prosecuted and fined up to £10,000 in line with the Northern Ireland level of operator fines generally. That amendment also introduced from the 1st of February a requirement for operators to check for completion of the passenger locator form and also introduce offences and penalties as in line with the above. Enforcement uh, it will be in relation to passenger arrivals, be by border force, and in relation to operator offences, the Maritime Coastal Agency and the Civil Aviation Authority. The final regulation that we are discussing today was Amendment Number Five and its SR 2021 Number Thirteen. This prohibits the arrival into Northern Ireland of certain aircraft and vessels from the countries that are subject to those additional measures. So at the moment, the South American and Southern African countries and Portugal. It also added the Democratic Republic of Congo and Tanzania to Schedule 5, um, those countries with additional measures. So I hope that's been a helpful summary of the changes within the six sets of regulations. And I appreciate that there's a lot to digest there, but I'm happy to elaborate if necessary or to address specific queries that the committee may have. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you, Elaine. So listen, um, I suppose the first one for myself is in relation to the, the new variants. And we're obviously now six weeks since the period just before Christmas when it was decided not to restrict or monitor or look at the travel in relation to the Kent variant. I was rather shocked, to have to say, to hear the Chief Medical Officer in recent days say that that variant is now two-thirds he, he estimates that is now two-thirds of our cases here. And given the increased issue of transmissibility, given we're still in the winter period and all of that, I think it very clearly outlines the need to really move uh, very, very quickly in relation to these new strains. And obviously, they could be they could be uh, emerging at any time. And we also are dealing with some, such as the South African variant, which we know is out there. So in terms of urgency... How quickly are these strains being identified and would it not make sense to have passenger locator forms in place so that in the event that a, a strain emerges, you already have a system in place rather than trying to devise a system of passenger locator forms or indeed mandatory hotel quarantine and those other measures? You could be too late given how quickly we have seen the, the Kent variant become established throughout the north. So um, what, yes, what's thank you, Chair. Yeah. 
So, yeah, so that was primarily the, the reason that we needed to suspend the travel corridors uh, to give us space and um, to look at this more, to look at a way we could be more responsive and to meet uh, the, the issue um, as it arises more quickly. So previously, prior to the suspension, travel corridors were assessed weekly, uh, and that included uh, any emerging variants that may have been identified. But it is recognised that that isn't necessarily rapid enough in the context of variants. So we are, as part of the review, looking at how quickly we need to be able to react when a variant has been identified and the surveillance that we need to put in place to identify those. Um, it is a difficult one in that because of the, many of the variants are outside of the UK, we are subject to how quickly other um, governments internationally sequence their cases and how, how able they are to identify variants within their own population. Um, but certainly from our side of things, we are recognising that this does need a very quick process that can be engaged rapidly and that am amendments can be made within probably 24 hours as once they've been identified. Okay, thank you. I'm going to I'm going to just move on there to members. First of all, I'll go with to our Deputy Chair Pam Cameron and then I see an indication from Paula. So we'll go to Pam first of all. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Elaine, again for your attendance at committee. Um, Elaine, could you tell me how many fines have been issued to those entering NI without a negative test result uh, um, to date, first of all? I don't have those figures. Uh, we haven't received any reports as yet um, on those fines that have been issued from Border Force, um, but I'll certainly get some statistics okay. uh, in the next couple of weeks through from them, and we can update committee on those. Okay, thank you. And okay, um, thank you. Uh, but, sorry, I'm not finished that, Chair. Sure. Yeah, um, go ahead. In, ter in terms of the, the negative test that needs to be provided, Elaine, um, is there a specific test that, that people need to use um, or purchase? So, for instance, is the, the NHS test itself, if it's taken within the, the correct time frame, is that sufficient? And um, if that is sufficient, is uh, the production of the email or the text result, is that sufficient to allow, or do you need an actual certificate? Um, so in terms of the test, the, we don't list the test specifically, but rather we list the performance standards that the test must meet. And that is 97% specificity and 80% sensitivity. Uh, so that can include tests such as the normal PCR test and also uh, loop mediated isothermal amplification lamp test. Um, the, the, is the NHS test sufficient? Uh, I guess in terms of technical standards, yes. But the, the other issue to bear in mind is that these tests must be paid for by the traveller. Uh, the, the testing capacity of the NHS shouldn't be used for international travel tests. So whilst it will meet the standards for the test, passengers should not be using an NHS test result um, and obtaining this solely for international travel. And uh, they should be, they can, I, I understand perhaps in England there might be a process to get a private NHS test where you do get the NHS test, but you pay for it. Um, but it's important just to make sure that people are aware that it, it, it's not a valid reason to go for a free NHS test if you need to travel. You should be funding that yourself. Okay, and but there isn't a facility to actually purchase a, an NHS test in Northern Ireland? Is that what you're saying? Um, I, at this point, I don't believe that there is, but I can follow up to, for, with, to make sure uh, that that's not the case. But I understand that's only in place at the minute in England. Okay, it would be worth checking up on that, I think, because um, certainly yeah, I've been no problem. contacted by somebody who who is um, was challenged and they needed a, a very expensive version of the test. Um, so it would be good to have that clarity around that. Um, it, could you tell me, Elaine, uh, around the effectiveness of the testing for hauliers travelling to the continent and air travellers from local airports? Um, how, how has that been since uh, the introduction? Um, well, we haven't had any feedback that from the. We have a, make, a weekly meeting with local um, border force staff in Northern Ireland and PSNI, and we haven't had any feedback that there's been any issues with the, the testing here, specifically. Um, the the tests for the hauliers in the south of France um, is largely managed by England now. So 
it was considered that there wouldn't be many hauliers wanting that in Northern Ireland because of the, the duration of having and the distance also to have to go and uh, the risk of them getting a positive test having travelled so far already and um, mm. that that's all managed in England so they get the test over there. Okay, that make, that makes sense. And can just my final one, could I ask um, if you know what routes of travel are more susceptible to breaches? Um, and if you do, how the enforcement is, uh, of those are being enhanced? Um, yeah, so uh, generally um, about a third of the fixed penalty notices that we've issued in Northern Ireland have been returning travel from Spain. Uh, and that's right back until last summer. Uh, recently, within the last few weeks, there has there's been a number of weeks where there hasn't been any fixed penalty notices needed to be issued, and that is largely re reflective of the fact that international travel isn't really happening um, in Northern Ireland. There's certainly, I'm not even sure if there are any direct fl international flights at the moment. If there are, they're minimal. Um, so I, I don't necessarily see that as a failure of enforcement. I think that's just generally reflective of the fact that people aren't travelling, um, and the follow-up checks are still happening as well. Uh, Okay, thank you. Thanks, Chair. Okay, thank you. Um, and just checking then, um, have we any other indications from other members? And also, I'd like to check that just with Clark in case there's anything that I have missed out on there. Sure, yeah. Oh, so I see. I see an indication then from Arlea, and I did hear from someone else. If you could raise your hand, but I do see Arlea Flynn. So go ahead, Arlea, please. Thanks, sure. Yes, Elaine, thank you for the presentation. Um, so just a couple of questions. I know that we had spoke um, to the Department member with it last week or the week before, um, whenever you were um, given the last update to the the health committee around the um, passenger locator forms and, you know, the, the issues that you were having with um, so people travelling from Britain into the north um, and the, the forms remember we had discussed maybe the department looking at the option of um you know adding on or amending um that form so people could make contact with the pha or a local authority do you know the way the form wasn't including um you didn't have that safety check on the form from people coming from the north um, yeah, so I had a I had a call actually we've been we've been pursuing this and I had a call most recently with the Department of Transport this morning. So we are progressing this. So what we're looking at is to see if the PLF could be amended for passengers indicate if they're coming onwards or if they're landing into Northern Ireland. Um, and it would be then it would be just a box that was ticked. So there'd be no personal identifiable information. Um, and we're exploring whether if that was to be done in the PLF if that could be passed to those making the sample checks so that they were able to run reports and determine with more cl more clarity how many of those sample checks are coming to Northern Ireland uh, and then that we would have at least a better handle on what's going on in terms of existing enforcement at the moment and then that would en enable us to to look and see whether anything else was needed at that point. Okay, Elaine, thanks. That That's good to know. And then I'm just wondering, um, do you use, ha have you used any figures around how many... Um, people have defaulted on the fixed penalty notice fines to date um, and and my final question is has the south uh, requested passenger locator form information from from the north okay um so the numbers of defaults on fixed penalty notices i don't have the number to hand um, and i'm not, not sure i can check with psni i know there was some that hadn't been paid um which was part of the amendment we made in december so any Expensive notices that we made since we made a commitment around mid December. They, there is an ability to to take that further if the fine isn't paid. Um, so I would need to go back to PSNI and just get a final number of the ones that were weren't paid outstanding part of that amendment. But that's one of the reasons we issued the amendment was we recognised that this was difficulty. Mm -hmm. In terms of the the South requesting passenger locator form information from us. They have informally asked if it would be possible. Um, they haven't come back with a formal request as yet, and we indicated to them at that point that if they did wish to have access to the data, that it wouldn't actually be with the Department of Health. They would need to get a memorandum of understanding directly with the Home Office as the ones that collect the information. Um, so there hasn't been anything further since that advice was provided, um, but if, if we do get a formal request, then we will obviously help engage with the Home Office with that. Thank you, Elaine. 
Okay, thank you. So Paula there, um, Paula Brad, Shaw, Paula, sorry, I had missed your hand signal there. Go ahead, please. Um, thank you, Chair. Thank you very much um, for coming before the committee again today. Um, is there any update on um, the proposal around people having to self-isolate in hotels? And also the second one would be, you know, we've been looking at these amendments to the travel regulations on and off um, for the last m many months. And I'm conscious that it's always like the hokey cokey um, that, you know, we put one in, one out. And is there not um, any discussion around wider bands in terms of regions as opposed to individual countries? Because we keep, as I say, um, you know, we're, we're moving, it's almost like moving the chairs um, and, and a new variant comes through and just feel like we're always playing catch up. Thank you. Yeah, um, so firstly, in terms of the hotels, so the England have made the firm policy decision that they are going to introduce a managed isolation. Uh, we've no firm time scale for that. And from our understanding, it will only apply to those countries with additional measures, such as the South African countries and the South American countries, where there is a risk of a variant arriving into the UK. Um, we're watching that closely and the executive office is leading on that uh, and we will let, uh, the executive will then determine whether they want to do something similar here. At the moment it's quite helpful in that the countries in question have no direct arrivals to Northern Ireland at the moment anyway, so they would all have to transit through London, in which case we would imagine that they will be picked up there, but we, we, we do need to work that through further in terms of transiting passengers. Uh, in terms of the, the countries, I do feel your pain with the hokey cokey, and if we, we, we feel the same, I have to say. Um, uh, regional variation or regional approaches is, is a useful one to think about. Um, I think a lot of the difficulties with the reason for the hokey cokey is partly um, wanting to be fair to those countries in terms of diplomatic relations as well. Uh, so we want to specifically say we don't want to penalise a country where they're perhaps beside a bad country, but they themselves are actually managing okay. Um, so that, that's more why we would take a country-by-country country approach. And it also uh, then takes into account the variations in testing that might happen between countries, which would potentially distort the picture slightly. Um, but it certainly is one to keep in mind as we move forward, um, because we, we are in this period where we are looking at absolutely everything. Uh, and it is certainly one that we can consider. Thank, thank you, Elian. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you. Um, and can I just check then if there are other, any other members indicating a question for Elaine before we, we let Elaine go? No, okay. Thank you. Thank you then, Elaine, as ever, for coming along to our, to our meeting and um, providing those updates and responses to the questions. Um, we will continue on with our consideration of it, but we can allow you to go ahead. Thanks again. Thank, thank you. you. All right, Lynn. Bye. Okay, members. Any further any further comment to make in relation to any of that, or further issues to raise? Hmm. Yes, Alan. Go ahead. No. 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 no didn't All right, Chairman. Then we get no. Okay. Thank you. Um. Do we have any other members indicating anything there in relation to that? No. Okay, members, we're, we're then going to... Uh, Carol, do we have Carol back on screen there? I've lost her on my screen. I see her now, but I'm just wondering, did she hear yeah, that previous? I, no, I did. Colm, I did a night. Sorry. So, yeah, I'm listening away. I'm fine. Thank you. Okay. And any, any further issues then anyone to raise before we consider each one in turn? Okay, thank you. So, members, we're going to go then to uh, the first one of these is SR 2021 forward slash four. The health, uh, and I refer members there to papers at tab eight of your pack. I remind members this SR provides for additional measures to be put in place in relation to certain countries. Have members any further issues they wish to raise in connection with this statutory rule? No. If therefore, can I ask members then to agree formally that the Committee for Health has considered SR 2021 forward slash four, the Health Protection Coronavirus International Travel Amendment Regulations NA 2021, and has no objection to the rule. Are we agreed? Agreed. Agreed. Thank you. Thank you, members. 
Item 9 then is SR 2021 forward slash 5. I refer members to your papers there at tab 9 of your pack. Can I remind members that this SR removes the United Arab Emirates from the list of countries and territories in respect of which travellers are exempt from the requirement to self-isolate for 10 days here in the north. The examiner for statutory rules has highlighted a drafting error in the rule which the department has confirmed it will correct at the earliest opportunity. Have members any further issues they wish to raise in connection with the statutory rule? No, okay, thank you then. Um, can I then ask members to agree formally that the Committee for Health has considered SR 2021 forward slash 5, the Health Protection, Coronavirus, International Travel, Amendment Number 2, Regulations NA 2021, and has no objection to the rule. Are members content? Yep, members are agreed. Thank you. SR 2021 forward slash 6, the Health Protection Coronavirus Travel Amendment Number 3, Regulations 2021. So I refer members then to the papers at tab 10 of your pack. This SR makes further amendments to the list of countries from which travellers are exempt from self-isolation requirements and also amends the list of countries subject to additional measures. Have members any further issues they wish to raise in relation to that rule? No members indicating. So therefore, can I ask members to agree formally that the Committee for Health has considered SR 2021 forward slash 6, the Health Protection, Coronavirus, International Travel, Amendment Number 3, Regulations 2021, and has no objection to the rule. Are we agreed? Yep, members agreed. Thank you. Item 11 is SR 2021 forward slash 9. I refer members to papers at tab 11 of your pack members. This SR removes all countries from the list of places from which travellers are exempt from the requirement to self-isolate. It requires those arriving here from outside the common travel area to self-isolate unless specifically exempt and removes exemptions relating to certain occupational groups. Have members any further issues they wish to raise in connection with this statutory rule? No. Therefore, can I ask members to agree formally that the Committee for Health has considered SR 2021 forward slash 9, the Health Protection, Coronavirus, International Travel, Amendment Number 4, Regulations 2021, and has no objection to the rule. Are we agreed? Agreed. agreed. Thank you, members. Thank you, members. Uh, item number 12 is SR 2021 forward slash 10, and I refer members to papers at tab 12 of your pack. This SR introduces a requirement for those arriving here to have notification of a negative COVID test upon arrival and places obligations on commercial transport operators in this regard. Have members any further issues they wish to raise in connection with that, this statutory rule? No. Therefore, then, I'd ask members to agree formally that the Committee for Health has considered SR 2021 forward slash 10, the Health Protection, Coronavirus, International Travel, Pre-Departure, Testing and Operator Liability, Amendment, Regulations 2021, and there's no objection to the rule. Are we agreed? Agreed. Thank you, members. And then... The final one of these set of statutory rules is SR 2021 forward slash 13. I refer members there to your papers at tab 13 of your pack. This SR introduces a new scheduled list of countries from which certain aircraft and vessels are banned from arrival and makes further amendments to the list of countries subject to additional measures. Have members any further issues they wish to raise in connection with this statutory rule? No. Well, therefore, can I ask members to agree formally that the Committee for Health has considered SR 2021 forward slash 13, the Health Protection, Coronavirus, International Travel, Amendment Number 5, Regulations 2021, and subject to the report of the Examiner of Statutory Rules, has no objection to that rule. Are we agreed? Agreed. We're agreed. Thank you. 
Okay, members, I'm now going to, uh, I will, I will, I'm going to take a very short break, members, just till 12.15, and then when we return, I want to return to the clerk uh, in, in relation to that, um, that, that mental health uh, one that we were considering, and we will deal with correspondence, but I'm just taking a very short break there for seven minutes, so please resume back again at 12.15. Thank you, members. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber. Okay, members. So uh, just just to just to confirm that where we had got to was we had uh, we had, we had sought clarity from Thomas on some situation some issues, and the clerk was seeking clarity in relation to the timing. I can confirm that this is the last opportunity upon which we have to consider this. I also want to confirm that the examiner has reported that the rule was laid in breach of the 21-day rule, but she is satisfied that the department has provided a satisfactory reason for the breach. So we had discussed members that that we would uh, that we would consider um, that we would consider stating that we have no objection to the rule, subject to a discussion with the Human Rights Commission, which which I will seek to do today and communicate back to members the outcome of that discussion. So, our members, if members are content, I'm uh, I'm happy to put the the question in that format. So, me- members content, members content with that, then. So, to agree formally that the committee for health has considered SR twenty twenty one forward slash eight, the mental health nineteen eighty six order amendment order. 2021 and subject to discussion with the Human Rights Commission has no objection to the rule. Our members agreed. Agreed. Yeah. Okay, members, thank you. And we will then resume again with a uh, correspondence, which is there at item. Um, just let me get it up here. So moving to item 14 there, members, correspondence. Have any uh, members any comments or proposals or any other items of correspondence? Anything any, anyone wants to raise? I'm not raising anything today in relation to correspondence now, so I'm just checking if members have any other issues there other than what has been outlined in the, in the, uh, the, the actions noted in the memo. Okay, so I'm not seeing anything. So then, are members otherwise content 
with the actions proposed on the correspondence memo? Yeah, members are content. Thank you. Moving then to table correspondence, the table pack contains two further items of correspondence. At page 13 of your table pack is a copy of a letter from the Speaker to the First Minister and the Deputy First Minister and the Minister for Health in relation to the timing of debates on the health protection regulations. The other item at page 17 of your table pack is a response from the Executive Office in relation to consideration of abortion services. Members may wish and, and uh, would members be content to raise these items of correspondence with the Minister who we will have at next week's briefing. Are members content to note pending scrutiny with the Minister? Yeah, thank you members. Moving on then members to the forward work programme. Um, item 15 is, I, I refer members there to the draft forward work programme which is tab 15 of your pack. Included in that tab is a letter from the Joint Oireachtas Committee um, for Health in relation to a joint virtual session with the CMOs, possibly in February, as the two Chief Medical Officers, which we have requested now for some time. Um, so the, it's, it's looking like that could be potentially end up for, for February. The committee team will continue to liaise with the Joint Committee to identify possible dates for that. At last week's strategic planning meeting, members requested regular update briefings on the rollout of the vaccine programme, you'll recall. The department has advised that Patricia Donnelly would be content to give a short update briefing each month to the committee, and the next session that we have scheduled in for that will be the 25th of February. So are members content to note the forward work programme on that basis? Agreed. Chair. Yeah. Chair? Yes, go ahead, uh, Paula, is it? Uh, yeah, thank you, Colin. Um, apologies, I, I think I maybe missed the very start of coming uh, when we came back there. But had we not asked Patricia for that daily um, sort of overview graph that sort of shows how many vaccines have been administered by um, population? Because I'm sure all the MLAs are the same as 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 me in terms of the inbox just overflowing with people very concerned about the rate of progress of it. And I'm just wondering what has been the response to the request from the committee for that daily graph? Thank you. Yeah, um, Clark, can you give us any uh, update on that? Sure, um, the, the committee has written to the department requesting that information, but we haven't had a response back yet. Sure, can okay. I, can yeah, I, go ahead, John. Yeah. No, I, I fully agree with Paula. Um, you know, this is something that the committee raised. And actually, I thought when Patricia Donnelly was before the committee that she was quite willing, to my knowledge, to share that. So I, I'm quite disturbed that it's, it's taken the length of time to come to us. No doubt that the information is already there with Patricia daily. And I, I think that given the way things are and, and we're listening to these uh, regular updates via the media or whatever it is in relation to vaccinations and the public concern, you know, it's again, this, this committee needs to be provided with the evidence and the, the daily evidence to show progress and show concerns that we can feed into as well. I also think maybe, um, I know uh, Patricia herself via email is quite easily contactable, but is there a way in which MLAs can generally feed into this going forward regarding concerns that they may have in, with individual constituents or indeed the wider constituency base as to the rollout of the programme? Okay, well, um, I suppose, Clark, we can we can reflect our, our concern at, at, at how long that's taken, which it does seem quite a, a straightforward matter. In relation to the ongoing input, um, Jonathan, would it not be the case that if Patricia is, is reasonably accessible, that for now we continue to do it in that fashion and we can bring it up again with Patricia on the 25th? Yeah, no, ha happy with that, sure. Yes, I suppose probably the proposal last week, I think, was to try and get, a, you know, a weekly sort of update regarding vaccination program from Patricia. I'm not sure if that is. Or it doesn't even sometimes have to be Patricia. It could be another member of that wider team that's just given us as a committee, you know, that urgent updates as this thing is, is progressing because we all know there's, there's shifts and turns in this every week daily. And it's only right that the health committee is, is kept aware of the progress. Chair, can I come back in, please? Yes, go ahead, Paula. Thank you, Chair. Well, um, the, the information, that sort of overview with the pie charts and graphs and stuff, I think that that would be very useful if it could be put up on the daily dashboard. And I think we've suggested that before. And again, I'm, I'm not sure why that, when there's so much other great information on the dashboard, why that isn't provided. Um, but I suppose the, the other um, issue is that 
there, there are people out there that are very, very anxious and there's a lot of misinformation on social media. And I think that it, it, it would be so useful so that our GPs aren't being um, contacted on a daily basis that that information. So it's for everybody's benefit that this information is in the public domain. Yeah, yeah, I think, and I think, I think it's also important, uh, committee, that we consider the impact that that a weekly briefing would have in terms of um, the very, very heavy schedule that we have. I think if we could get the information provided on a regular basis, if we have contact with Patricia and if she's doing a formal briefing on a monthly basis, I certainly think for now that will cover. We can review it again, but are members content? Are members content with that uh, for now? Do we see how that? Pam, go okay. ahead. Yes, yeah, Pam. Yeah, content with for now, but I had thought that. I thought it was maybe the minister had mentioned at one stage that that, that they were going to publish the vaccine uh, information on the on the dashboard. I think that's. I think he did say that. I could be making that up, yeah. but I think he did say that at one stage at the past there. But it would be good to have that information. Mm -hmm. Certainly, um, I had a meeting with um with BMA and with uh, Dr. Alan Stout there, um, around GP vaccination and stuff and it was very useful as well but there there is a lot of confusion out there and people don't fully understand the twin track approach and whatnot so i think just as much um information come our way we we could help and uh and disseminate that information to our constituents and to the wider public and maybe help ease the pressure on uh, both trusts and on gp practices because we understand they're they're working very hard to roll out as quickly as possible and do yeah. in a small way to help with in terms of passing on the information and getting answers to queries you know i certainly be willing to help okay and and i just do want to point out that we actually the minister will be briefing us next week vaccinations will be a key part of that both in terms of his update and and that will be a way to bridge the gap between between others so we do have a fairly regular commitment from the minister in relation to that at which vaccinations will clearly, clearly be a key so i think there are there are other opportunities as well Okay, um, anything else then, members, in relation to that issue? Okay. Okay, so members, are members there for content to note the forward work programme? Are we agreed? Yeah. Okay, moving on then, members, to any other business. Do we have any other business today? Alan, sure. go ahead. Thank you, Chair. Uh, can you hear me okay? I can hear you there, yes. Thank you, Chair. Chair, just a just a, a small motion I'd like to put uh, to the committee and and seek their support. And uh, it reads that this committee uh, wishes to register its sympathy to the family of Captain Tom Moore, who passed away in recent days. And we also wish to acknowledge and place on record our grateful thanks for the vast sums of money that Captain Tom raised for NHS charities. Happy to second that, Alan. Yep. Members, any other views? Yeah, so, uh, thank you, Alan. I think that's a good idea. Thank you. Mr. Chair. Yes, go ahead, Pam. Um, yeah, absolutely. Delighted to support that motion. Thank you, Alan, for bringing that to committee. I think it's um, it's an incredible uh, thing that Captain Tom did in his last year of life and um, starting off with an ambition of raising a thousand pounds and ending up, at, I think, near the thirty-three million pounds is incredible. And we know that local services have benefited from from this these money. So, absolutely, I think that's entirely appropriate. And and want to thank Alan for bringing forward that proposal. Okay, so are members content. Content. Okay, thank you. Sure. Okay, no. any other business? Yes, Jonathan? Yeah, ahead. sure. A number of weeks ago, actually, you weren't in the chair due to a family bereavement. Uh, I, I raised at the committee uh, by means of a proposal in, in relation to um, asking the department to come forward urgently to give us an update as to the rationale and reasoning behind the public inquiry into Dr. Aidan O'Brien. Um, I'm quite alone that we've heard nothing back from the department in relation to this, given its seriousness. Um, in some regards, you know, we have to realize that this this is having a, a huge impact on people's personal lives. Um, talking to people, patients, uh, our uh, practitioners, etc. 
rationale behind this public inquiry, and I think the committee has been. I do think the committee needs an urgent uh, update from the department before any moves are made in relation to this matter. Any other views, members? Chair, I, I couldn't hear all of what Jonathan said. Apologies, I don't know if anybody else has having the same difficulties. I, I didn't I didn't hear it all. I lost a lot of the second part yeah. of half of what you were saying, Jonathan. So maybe if you could pick that up again. Yeah, I could, I could repeat that, members. I'm sorry, because I think we're all suffering from signal. Can we hear me now? Yes? Yes, hearing you just at present, yeah. Yes. So I brought to the committee's attention my concern regarding the public inquiry into Dr. Aidan O'Brien. Um, it was announced in the chamber. Uh, we as a committee have received no formal evidence from the department in relation to the rationale behind that. I have some very deep concerns surrounding that. And I think that the committee uh, needs to hear urgently from the department before any further steps are taken in relation to this matter. Uh, a failure to do so would be holding the committee in contempt, in my opinion. It's a very serious matter that uh, we as a committee for the health department deserve to have uh, for uh, supported my proposal on that before that, that we hear urgent information. Okay. Um, any other members' views on that? Okay, well, I just I just want to say I I do believe it's appropriate to seek an update on on including uh, including the rationale. I've no issue with that. Uh, I think we 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 do need to get an update, uh, and that's appropriate. I am conscious that these are are ongoing proceedings and and active proceedings and important proceedings in that sense as well. I am not content that that we indicate that nothing further happens until such time as that briefing is received. I'm conscious that the minister is with us next week, and I believe that will be an ideal opportunity for the minister to update us if committee members wish. And committee members will have will have question time. So um, go ahead, Paula. Thank you, Chair. Um, I suppose we, if we're going to sort of give the health minister a bit of a, an understanding of the type of questions we're going to be asking next week, I would be interested to receive an update on the review into what happened with the mass resignation of the RQIA um, board and the um, events that led up to that, please. Thank you. I agree. I agree. Okay, members agreed to that, and our members agreed that we also flag up to, to the minister that we will we will we are seeking an update uh, in terms of the in terms of the uh, the inquiry the the PA on the, on that subject. Have someone else indicating there as well? Yeah, yeah, chair, uh, yeah. column, it's myself. Yeah. Um, I I noticed that the minister said in the chamber that he couldn't go into any details on the CSS position. But I do think we need an update about alternatives. Maybe he's already had it and I've missed it. So if that's the case, apologies. Um, but given the fact that the CSA and the CMO advise the minister and indeed the executive, I think it's appropriate for us to find out what is going on as much as possible and what alternatives are being put in place. It's all yes, Professor Young. Yeah, members agreed with that also, and and also also clerk, if we could indicate to the to the, the the minister in the department that some of this may be in the form of written briefing prior to the meeting, but also that members members can raise this, but to be to be to have that in in his radar that he knows that these issues are of interest to the committee. So, are members content with those proposals? Okay, thank you, members. Okay, um, members, then moving on to date, time, and place of next meeting. Our next meeting will be on Thursday, 11th of February at 9.30 a.m. via video link when we will have the Minister briefing the committee. So thank you, members, for your attendance today, and I will see you all again next week. Thank you. Gary Magov, Agus Slam. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly, Senate Chamber, Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly, Senate Chamber, Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly, Senate Chamber, Programme Sound.